So we're going to be uh, using dry needling onto the spinal tissues now and we're concerned with trigger points so we're going to be looking at the muscles themselves. So in the centre here we've got the spinous processes and to the side of the spinous processes in the paraspinal gutter we have our multifidus and we tend to think of the multifidus as being one of the prime stabilising muscles and having a tendency to waste, which indeed it does, but it can also go into spasm and be a source of pain. As we come further out, we're on to our longissimus, and the longissimus muscle is two to three finger widths broad. As we go further out, we come to our iliocostalis. Beneath it, we have our quadratus lumborum, and then over the top, we have our oblique abdominals coming in and attaching to the lateral rafe, to the, to the lateral border of the thoraca lumbar fascia. So we're going to look at two techniques. We're going to look at a multipedus technique and we'll look at the most common erector spiny technique which is to the longissimus itself. So we'll start off with the longissimus because it is uh, one of the ones which is far more common. So we can palpate into this area and we can use a flicking palpation where we just draw the fingers inwards and we're looking to reproduce his symptoms or to find a taut band which is a little bit like um, a pencil lying within the muscle itself. So as we flick over it, it just feels slightly tighter. Okay, so we've actually have a a taut band into this area so we can use that one later but at the moment we're going to restrict ourselves into the lumbar spine here and we're going to look at this lumbar area so from L2 down tends to be the area which is most common in terms of uh, mechanical pathology of the lumbar spine at least so we've got our hand sanitizing gel if you have somebody with a very deep lordosis you can place a bolster um, beneath the abdomen so that we're just flattening that out. We've got our needle and we can needle either away or towards the spine, um, towards ourselves, but um, I tend to find that the needle is more controlled if you're coming towards yourselves. So we've got our spinous processes here and we want to find the centre of the muscle. So the centre of the muscle is approximately two finger widths from the spine. So the angle of the needle is important here. We want to angle the needle in towards the spine, so either coming in this way or coming in this way if we're on the other side. That way, although I've used a 30 mil needle, so I know that I can't get down to any structure, so I can't get down to the to the spine from this position, from the spinal cord, and I can't get down to the kidney. But by angling, I'm just making sure that if I had chosen an inappropriate needle and I press that needle in too far, then all that's going to happen is that needle will strike bone. So it's moving towards a safe position rather than coming here where with a very long needle it could be moving towards the kidney. So coming from this position, centre of the spinous process, out by two finger widths, isolate the muscle itself, so I'm going to draw the muscle tight, tap the needle, tight muscle, and then the needle comes in. So you can see that that needle is angling at 45 degrees to the skin surface. So I can judge the depth of the needle. So if we have a three centimetre needle, a 30 mil needle, I'm going in by two centimetres if there's only one centimetre of the needle shaft remaining. So I know the depth of that needle. But of course, by going in two centimetres at a 45 degree angle, the actual vertical depth is considerably less. So I'm palpating that area. And I'm moving the needle very slightly just to feel that sensation in the muscle. As I withdraw the needle, I draw it further out so I've got two centimetres of my needle showing. I can release the muscle and then flick the needle out, 
compressing the area if I've got a spot of blood. So that's our erector spinae, and that was the longissimus portion, so the central portion of the erector spinae. If I want to needle the iliocostalis, the technique is broadly similar, but because I'm further out, the muscle is thinner, so my angle, rather than being 45 degrees, would be about 20 degrees to the skin. We're going to move inwards now, and we're on to the multifidus. So we know that the multifidus lies within the paraspinal gutter. So it is in this area between the spine on one side and the longissimus portion of the erector spinae on the other side. So it's going to be in here. Now, on a subject who's quite powerful, the muscle itself will often, the longissimus muscle, will often fold over the multifidus. So if you could just lift your chest off the bench. So you can see here, the longissimus muscle has completely obliterated the paraspinal gutter. And just rest down again. Now, on an elderly subject, that wouldn't be the case, and you may see that the the um, longissimus is wasted, and you can actually palpate the, uh, the multifidus itself more readily. Okay, so the technique I'm going to use then is a vertical technique towards the side of the spinous process. So my finger is located on the spinous process, and I'm putting the tube of the needle almost touching the side of my finger. Tap that in and then I can go down vertically because I'm, I'm central to the spine itself. So I'm perfectly safe because of the depth of the multifidus. So we know that the spinal cord is a lot deeper than my one centimeter insertion. So we've got the chorda equina between two to three centimeters depth and I'm just much higher than that level. So I'm just stimulating that multifidus muscle coming up and down. Now there's a difference obviously with the multifidus in that it's in individual blocks, so it's a segmental muscle, whereas our longissimus is in long strands, so it's polysegmental. So I would need to cover a longer area of the, the longissimus than the multifidus. So once I've used that, I'm withdrawing that needle, pressing the skin down. Now once I have used my dry needling, we would need to put that into, into context and say, well, it may well be that I wanted to do some manual therapy, so I might have done the manual therapy first, the dry needling second, or vice versa. But either way, I'm using the dry needling as part of my manual therapy treatment toolbox, really. Okay, so as we come further up here, we have an additional consideration, and that obviously is the chest cavity. So we know that if I place a needle through the chest cavity, I can actually pierce the membrane which covers the lung. So I can pierce the pleura and cause a pneumothorax. So we need to make sure that we're using a technique which makes the, the risk of pneumothorax virtually impossible. So I'm going to keep myself in towards the center of the spine. I'm going to angle my needle and I'm going to make sure that my vertical depth is never greater than one centimeter on the chest wall. And the reason for that is that we know in the cadaver that the um, the pleura can be, uh, can be touched with a needle of one centimetre depth. Now, in actual fact, with this particular subject, because he has good muscle tone, we have quite a thick muscle here, so the depth would be greater. However, if I press and I press that muscle down, obviously now I'm actually closer to his pleura, closer to his lung. 
So the techniques that I use would be muscle fold techniques, drawing the muscle upwards. So for the sake of argument, if we say, well, we've got a depth of the pleura of one centimeter, and we've got a one centimeter muscle on top, giving me a, 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 a total safety margin of two centimeters, if I reduce that down to one centimeter again, I need to use a smaller needle. If I take the muscle fold and I draw it upwards, then potentially I could use a, a, a longer depth. But when we come into this area, I'm still going to be angling my needle. So if I have a, a needle in this position and I insert it by one centimeter, the depth to any structure is exactly that measurement, one centimeter. But if I insert it at an angle by one centimeter, the vertical depth is considerably less. So the advantage of that is I still get a good amount of the needle into the muscle. So I'm going to stimulate the needle and stimulate the muscle uh, just as well because the needle is quite long, but I don't have the risk of um, damaging any structures. So I've got my spine here, I've got my longissimus portion here, so the thoracic portion of the longissimus, whereas in the lumbar spine I said I can press the muscle down, in the thoracic spine I'm going to lift the muscle up. So I'm going to um, form a fold, so that would be my skin fold. I want to form a muscle fold, place the needle onto the skin, strike the needle. So I, my thumb is now on the spine, my finger is on the rib, so I, know, I can see the depth of muscle above me, but even so I'm keeping the angle of the muscle, the angle of the needle going into the muscle. So the vertical depth would only be about half a centimetre into a raised muscle. So I can stimulate safely here using that technique. So withdraw the needle. As it comes out, I can release my muscle fold. So using a muscle fold makes it safer by drawing the muscle towards you and therefore increasing the proportion of muscle depth above the pleura. Angling the needle reduces the vertical depth um, uh, in, um, from the uh, tip of the needle to the pleura. So that's our longissimus and our multifidus.